Hello, Mixtresses and Mixters. This is Mixtress Ray, and you're watching Mixtress Video. So, I'm back. <laughs> um, I have, I took a self-imposed, intentional, three-month sabbatical from creating YouTube content, and um, it was really good for me. So, this video, I think, is likely going to be um, a lot of random shit, um, but I mostly wanna focus on what I've learned so far and kind of do an update on my 2024 no buy. So to sort of review the rules, which I actually didn't get them out, the rules for my particular no buy is, um, I am not buying anything online this year. The exceptions are I'm allowed to buy things from thrift books. So I'm allowed to buy books at reasonable prices, <laughs> essentially. And they also have like DVDs and CDs sometimes, but not as much. Um, and they also do have tarot decks. I haven't ever bought a tarot deck from thrift books, but they do have them. Um, so the exceptions are thrift books. I can, if there's like something that needs to be replaced, like for example, my computer monitor has been on the fritz ever since I bought it many years ago. If it ever actually completely dies, I might allow myself to buy a computer monitor online. But the idea is that I have to try to find something in person before I resort to buying something online. So that's the online aspect of my no buy. Um, and then I'm also, I sort of, after I started the year, I kind of, um, expanded it to include just my whole life. So basically I only buy something now if I've completely run out of all other options and I've already explored the idea of, do I want to start making this thing myself? Yes or no. Um, Basically, I mean, this is out of necessity, too. Like, I am a low-income bitch, and things have gotten a lot more expensive in the last few years, as we all know. So, you know, some of this is by necessity, and some of it is just a natural continuation of my, um, my attempts to break my shopping addiction, which is a very real thing, and I will not have you guys telling me it's not. So... I don't know, like, I feel like I'm not used to doing this anymore, this whole video thing. So I don't know, like, I have like 15 ideas of like a video that I want to give you guys. And I'm choosing to sort of, I think I'm going to combine a lot of those ideas into this one video. So you can see how long it is. <laughs> um, because I have like, okay, I'll just give you the list from my journal of the ideas that I had for videos that I want to give you guys. Um, I want to rank all the Cure albums, which is one of the reasons why I have about all my entire record collection of Cure albums is right here, which is most of the important ones actually. <laughs> so that is probably going to be part of a series called No One Asked because no one cares about how I rank Cure albums. Essentially, me taking three months off of YouTube has um, put a lot of things in perspective for me. Like, I have a lot that I feel like I've made progress on in my life, and I have a lot that I want to say about particular things. Um, but right now it's just like, <laughs> Um so we'll see, we'll see. This is probably going to be a very, and I have not been diagnosed, but it is possible that there's some ADHD going on with me. Um, I've always just mostly identified with the autism aspect of neurodivergence, but they overlap so much that I would not be surprised if I'm also. So anyway, I wanna rank my Cure albums for you guys. We'll see if I do that in this video or not. I have them sort of in an order over here in case I do want to do that. 
Um, I thought about doing one of those like tier ranking things. That's kind of what I want to do with this, but um, with my tarot decks that I have left, <laughs> you know, um, but I need to create a visual aspect for that in order to, so that's not going to be this video. Um, just kind of letting you know what's coming, I guess. I kind of wanted to talk about hygiene, like how I, how my relationship to hygiene products, beauty products, and bathing has changed. Um, not that, you know, I'm not a beauty tuber, so like that's not something that I've talked about a lot before anyway, but I kind of want to talk about that stuff. So that might be in this video. Um, I want to give you some budget witch tips, which is not something that I'm highly qualified to do because my witchiness is not super well defined in my life, which is another topic that I want to talk about also in a future video, which is a bigger topic. I want to talk about beliefs. Like, do I believe that I'm psychic? What do I believe in? How has that, how has my relationship to spirituality changed over the course of my lifetime? That's a bigger topic, so that's not going to be today. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. I want to do pick a pile readings again. This is something that more I want to talk about in the sort of like my relationships to spirituality video, but I am kind of, I haven't decided yet but I'm thinking about, I closed my tarot reading shop, um, I think in January or February. I just decided I wasn't gonna do readings for people any, I wasn't gonna do readings for strangers anymore. Like people, you know, friends and family and you know, people I've done readings for before, if they come to me and ask me, like I'll set something up for them. But I'm not doing like official, like somebody can go to my shop and order a reading but I'm thinking about opening that back up again, but again, haven't decided. So that's gonna be something that I talk about in that like belief video. Sorry, my lights are kind of flickering. I don't know if it's the electricity. I think it's actually just one bulb in my ceiling fan that's probably about to go out. So I don't know if you guys can tell that that's happening, but if it's annoying to you, I'm sorry, it's probably gonna burn out soon. Um, let's see, what else? It's also kind of storming outside, so if you hear like thunder and stuff, I mean, you probably know what that is, but it's happening. <laughs> I also have a tarot deck that was sent to me for review um, that is coming out around the time that this video will go live. So it might even come out within the next few days because I do plan to go ahead and review that one. I had gone back and forth about that a lot, but I'm pretty sure I am gonna go ahead and review it. Um, so yeah, anyway, the point is I have many pages of notes in my journal of things that I want to share with you guys because like for a while doing this YouTube sabbatical, I wasn't sure if I was going to come back. You know, I was really questioning a lot of things at the beginning of this year, which again is going to be more part of that like beliefs video if I do decide to do that because it's such a big topic and it's, it's going to be really uh, possibly controversial I, maybe not controversial, but it's going to be like emotionally fraught, emotionally heavy. I don't know. It's going to be difficult for me to put it out there, even if it's not difficult for other people to hear necessarily, but just like discussing what I believe is going to be difficult. <laughs> you can't even see that these are like beautiful Thank you to my friend Dolores who sent me this shirt. Um, I, I feel I feel fish right now, guys. <laughs> I feel like, yeah. But please know that the bottom half of this outfit is sweatpants. <laughs> it took me so long to put this much makeup on my face, guys. And my skin does not like it. Like, it's probably going to come off as soon as I hit stop. Anyway, let's get into the meat of the video finally, right? Like... I, this year, I think I've, I'm, I hesitate to make this statement because it, I, 
because I'm afraid that, you know, if I say it out loud, I'm going to jinx it, right? But I think I have mostly broken my shopping addiction and it's because of the no buy. It's, I mean, it's, it's several things. It's the fact that like, I have been talking about my shopping addiction struggles. I have been investigating them like through journaling, through talking to you guys about it, through talking to my patrons on Patreon, through talking to friends. Like I have been in it with this shit and I've been trying to make like different rules for myself trying to figure it out, trying to navigate like what works for me as far as that shit is concerned, how much guilt and shame surrounding the shopping addiction is something that has a source elsewhere that needs to be investigated versus how much of it is a solid motivator for me ceasing that behavior altogether, etc. Like I've been investigating that since like 2020. <laughs> quite seriously. Um, and it's a habit that started way before I started collecting tarot decks, but that was mostly the context with which I've talked to you guys about it because most everybody that's subscribed to my channel right now is subscribed because I talk about tarot primarily, which I don't know. I don't know what the fuck my YouTube channel is going to look like. And I think I've said that several times to you guys, like now that I'm not buying tarot decks anymore, hardly at all. Like I haven't bought any this year. Full stop. Not a single one, not a single tarot deck, not a single oracle deck. And it's not because I have, I don't have a rule against buying a tarot deck or oracle deck this year. Um, if I want to go out to my local chain bookstore, local chain bookstore, but um, if I want to go out and buy a tarot deck, I can do it. I could leave the house and be back within half an hour with a new tarot deck. And it wouldn't be against any of my rules. Um, so I just haven't, I haven't had the desire to, because for one, I think everything, first of all, I don't know everything that's coming out right now, but most of it is really, seems really boring to me. So I'm not interested um, for one, like I haven't seen something that I really want in a long time which is a little sad, you know, like at this point in time, because I'm not really buying a bunch of tarot decks anymore. Like if I did see something that looked really interesting to me, I would be excited to get it. Um, and I'd want to share it with you guys. So, I mean, that could happen, but it just hasn't. So anyway, that's, that's an aside, but like, um, what was I talking about with that? Oh, this is the year that like I made very finite, very finite is not the word, well-defined um, rules for myself. You know, like I am not buying anything online this year unless it's a replacement or it's something from thrift books. Cause I decided, ultimately I decided like buying books is not a problem for me. Um, so I would allow myself to do that because you know, whenever I make an order on thrift books, I'm usually buying two or three books at a time and I'm usually spending less than $20. So it's just a fun way to get myself a little treat that, and most of the time, the way that I buy books is I will check something out from the library, read it and realize I'm going to want to read it again. So that's why I buy it. Um, usually is the context there. Um, so yeah, it's, my life is different now and it's better because for me, I found that like, besides the, the money aspect of it, which is definitely an important aspect of it. Like I was spending money, I was spending grocery money sometimes on tarot decks. So that was absolutely not a behavior that I could financially su sustain, but also it was putting me in a state of dysregulation and anxiety all the time. Like waiting for packages, tracking packages, um, trying to decide what I want to buy. And I was in such a habit of buying stuff all the time that I was getting packages on my porch several times a week. 
and I would feel withdrawal if I wasn't expecting something. And I just, you know, the way that my psychological makeup is, and don't feel bad if you don't feel this way, I'm not passing judgment on anyone else, but for me, I don't actually enjoy new things. Like there's the excitement when you first like, you know, get something, right? But most of the time, I then immediately have anxiety about what am I gonna do with this thing? Do I actually want this thing? Do I actually like this thing? This is all stuff I've talked about before, but like, I just wanted to sort of give you guys an update from the standpoint of, it's completely different now. I feel so much better because I'm not giving myself the option to do that to myself anymore. It's not an option. And, you know, obviously we're not even completely halfway through. Well, by the time you see this, we are halfway through the year. Um, I'm recording this a little early because I'm kind of excited to come back to YouTube, but <laughs> I'm not actually going to post it until my sabbatical is up. But um, I, what, I just lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> um, YouTube sabbatical. Um, I totally lost it. I totally lost it. I distract myself when I'm looking at my own fucking face. It's weird. But I did want to like, I wanted my return to YouTube to be like my actual fucking face. Anyway, my life is totally different now. Oh, okay. That was what it was. That was what it was. It's probably not going to be like my online no buy 2024. It's probably going to be my life no buy. You know, it's going to be my online no buy. Full stop. This is just how I operate now because this is the way to operate for me because, okay, so what have I learned? This is what I wanted to really share with you guys, what I've learned on my no buy. One of the things, like I said before, like when I run out of something, I will explore, well, do I even need to replace this thing? And if so, do I want to make it? And if not, then I'll allow myself to buy it, you know? So like, for example, I, um, this, this one, I didn't actually finish a journal in order to st make one, but I decided to make a journal this year. Um, this is like an old, like Reader's Digest book cover. And I just, you know, got these little ring, these little ring things and punched holes. And I used old, like, papers from zines and things. Oh, look, there's, there's a naked Betty page right there. Um, <laughs> so I used like even old, like homework assignments that for some reason I still had the pages for like, why? I don't know. Here's my, uh, signature from, um, <laughs> from high school. Uh, it still looks mostly like that. Um, yeah, I just, so I just took like a bunch of different paper, cut it down to size, punched holes, and you know, like it's not, I didn't learn book binding, but you know, I'm using things that I already have to make things. And it's so fucking satisfying to me to use what I have. And like, I, I'm just now, this is kind of exciting to me. I'm at the end, like I probably have one more wash with the hall closet shampoos, you know, like shampoos that we bought at some point and we didn't really like them. So we stopped using them and threw them in the hall closet. Um, this entire year, I haven't had to buy a shampoo because I've been using the hall closet shampoos. <laughs> we did have a couple of hall closet conditioners, but I went through those a couple, I was through those a few months ago, but um, yeah. I'm finally to the point where I can buy the shampoo that I want <laughs> because I'm not going to try to make my own shampoo. Um, I mean, it's something that I could maybe think about exploring in the future, but for now I have a favorite shampoo. So I'm going to go back to buying that. Um, I get to have my favorite again. <laughs> um, so it's just been really satisfying. It's been really satisfying. Like, and this is also a couple, this isn't just me doing a no buy, but also I spent years trying out different things 
and investigating my shopping addiction issues and talking it through. And then I did a big declutter last year that started just a general decluttering process in my life. Like I regularly will sort of randomly think, oh, you know what? I haven't decluttered yet. I haven't decluttered my books. I definitely have. That was one of the first things I thought of, but just as an example, like, you know what? I haven't decluttered yet this. And then I'll spend an hour doing that. And for me, less is more. And for me, I use things more when I have less. Um, so that was also a big part of this process. Like, so it was like years of investigation, then a big decluttering project in 2023, then my no buy in 2024 is what, like, I feel like I'm coming to you from a standpoint of someone that's kicked their addiction. Of course it could come back. I could relapse. And of course I'll talk to you guys about it if that happens because I think it's important to not necessarily be public with your addictions. It's important for me to process things. And as long as I'm still enjoying doing it in this format, I will continue. So I'll let you know if, it, if that changes. But that was part of the reason why I took a break from YouTube too, because I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue doing this. I'm glad that I'm deciding to continue doing this but yeah it took some it took some investigation and that is another tip that I have or maybe not tip but it's something that I've learned that if if you're similar to me maybe it could be helpful for you um, is that for me like when I it's really revealing when you take a break from something you're used to doing or take a break from something you're used to having. It's really revealing as far as like, do you even want it anymore? You know, like a, a mundane example of this would be if you're used to having, to getting like a subscription box of a particular thing and like you've had the same subscription box for five years and you get it every month, then, you know, I think it's useful to take a break to cancel that subscription or do that thing where you're like, I don't want it for three months, you know, and then you come back to it or whatever. Um, or you take that time to choose whether or not you want to come back to it. Like I am so far into this process for myself that like if I run out of like, for example, when I ran out of face wash back in like February, I ran out of face wash. And my first question was, do I even want to buy another face wash? So I spent some time, it was probably like around a month before I bought another face wash, where I just like, you know, I would get like a washcloth wet with warm water and just like rub it on my face to sort of gently exfoliate. And that worked okay for a little while, but I did ultimately decide I enjoy face wash. Like maybe it's not needed truly I mean it is needed when you got to wash all this shit off your face but on days like I don't wash my face every day if I don't have makeup to wash off and I'm, my face isn't feeling really oily or I haven't had to put on sunscreen that day or whatever I'm not necessarily gonna wash my face unless it feels dirty you know like I'm not gonna do it just to do it you know I've never been that kind of person really um, so I did investigate, like I took some time, like, do I even want to buy face wash anymore? Is this something that I actually need? Or is this something that like, you know, cosmetic companies have told me that I need. And I do think it's something that cosmetic companies told me that I need, but I, and there might even be, I might not even have face wash in the winter, but in the summer I break out more, I sweat more, I use sunscreen more. Um, so for now I have face wash again. But, you know, it's, I'm enjoying being in this space of like, not automatically doing things. I'm investigating. Why am I doing things? Is this a habit that I created 10 years ago that no longer works for me? I'm just kind of like investigating everything. And I'm coming up with simpler solutions um, to things. I guess. Um, 
I wrote here, I enjoy what I have more than wanting what I don't have. I have become very budget, not like budget conscious, like I'm not actually sitting down going, I'm allowed to spend $20 this month on cosmetics. You know, I'm not doing that kind of thing, but I am like being very real with myself about what I can afford. You know, I'm switching to things that you know, every single cosmetic hygiene product, etc. I guess I'm kind of dipping into the whole hygiene thing. Every single thing like that that I have, I get at the grocery store. I don't go to a special store to get it. Um, I mean, the only exception to that would be my favorite perfume, my signature perfume, which I'm not gonna run out of anytime soon, but when I do, I have to buy it online. Um, but other than that, like I, I'm not buying, I'm not buying lipstick from fancy places anymore and you know, and it's fine. It's fine. If you can't afford all that expensive indie shit that you buy online, it's fine. The drugstore shit is just as good. I promise you it's just as good. I mean, if you can afford that other stuff and you enjoy supporting like, you know, beautiful indie makeup brands and stuff if you can afford it and you like it do it I'm not in that circumstance and that's totally fine like I don't you guys have seen like a chunk of my life where I was feeling very deprived and jealous of other people I don't really know the difference between jealousy and in envy, but I was envious of other people, I think maybe is the better word, but you know what I mean? Like, I would see people that could spend a lot of money on all of these nice things, and I wanted to be able to do it too, but I don't feel deprived anymore, you know? And that's great. It's wonderful not to feel deprived, let me tell you. Um, oh, one of the biggest things that I've learned, I've been keeping track of my empties this year. Um, and I also did, I'm, I'm not super consistent with that. Like sometimes I forget to write it down for a month, but overall I've been trying to like, I have a little document in my phone of like, you know, what have I used up all of this year? Um, and I did an inventory at the beginning of the year of a bunch of different consumables to see how many of those things I have at the end of the year. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. I'll have those numbers to give you guys at the end of the year maybe, but um, so I've been keeping track of my empties and um, let, me, let me give you an overall, like a sort of bird's eye view. I've used two face washes this year, used up. So like I'd already started all of these things I'd already started at the beginning of the year. It wasn't like I was starting a fresh face wash on January 1st, you know, but I have emptied two face washes this year, two conditioners and two shampoos. And it's June. Like you're seeing this like three weeks after I'm filming it almost, but still it's June 3rd as I record this. I have only used two conditioners, two shampoos, and two face washes in all of 2024. Um, I've used up one body lotion, one perfume, which again, this is like an oil-based perfume, like this, this size bottle, like a little five milliliter bottle. I emptied one of those this year that I started like literally years ago. So it's not, you know, it's not like I used that up this year. It's just, I finally emptied it this year. Um, one face lotion, like one face moisturizer, I've used one mascara and one like liquid eyeliner. Again, all those things started before the beginning of the year. It's possible that that mascara stat is incorrect because mascara tends to irritate. I don't like mascara and I get to a point where like mascara expires quickly. I think like all other makeup like you can use for a long time I probably use it way beyond when I should be using it with everything else but with mascara I tend to throw it out after like three months so it's possible that mascara stat is wrong like maybe I forgot to mark one of the empties maybe it's been two or three mascaras so far this year but I don't wear makeup that often either 
Um, but every time I wear makeup, I wear mascara. So anyway, the point is, and this was eye-opening to me, so maybe it is to you too, like we don't actually use that much <laughs> with consumables. Like those people, those beauty tubers that do their like monthly empties and they have like a whole like little basket of shit that they're like empty containers that they're holding up. How? How? How are they using that much? They have to be lying, don't you think? Or else they're using a copious amount of shit. I mean, I guess, again, like I said, I don't wash my face every single day. I don't moisturize every single day. Like, I don't do everything every single day. I don't have enough executive functioning for that. <laughs> you know, I really don't. And that's fine, like I'm okay with that. And I realize that other people have more of a ritual than, like I guess if you're washing your face every single day, maybe you would have gone through more than two by June. But for sure, for sure you would have. But still. So that's eye-opening and also super fucking wasteful if people are like squirting things into the trash so that they can show you they're empty. I mean, I'm not saying everybody that says they're doing, they're showing their empties is doing that. Obviously that's not the case, but there probably are people that are doing that. And that's shitty. That's just wasteful. That's bad for the environment. That's, yeah, it's not good. It's not good. Um, not that I don't do things that are bad for the environment, but I try to, you know, like reduce, reuse, recycle. I really try to reduce and reuse as much as possible. Because again, like I am buying the bulk of my shit from like Walmart, Target, Dollar Tree, like these aren't ethical places to buy things, but I at least am using up every single fucking drop. Like that face moisturizer that I used up, I had had for a long time and it, it had a pump, which I try to avoid things with pumps overall because you know, that's just piling up in a landfill somewhere. But it did have a pump. So whenever I got to the point where the pump was no longer getting anything, I still had like another two weeks of like, you know, taking the lid off and doing this with the container. Um, anyway, I'm just going off on wastefulness now. But the point is, like the stats show, you're not using that much stuff. You know, I only like, okay, so I've bought which I haven't had to buy because hall closet, hall closet supply has been there. But essentially, if I only used up two shampoos and two conditioners in the course of six months, you know, that's one every three months, right? And also, again, it should be noted, I only wash my hair once a week. So obviously, but I do tend to use a lot of it for all of this fucking hair. So, it's a big application, but only once a week. Anyway, the point is, you don't use as much as you think you're gonna use. You don't actually need that much of that shit. And so it's definitely giving me pause if I, and I'm not a person that likes to try a lot of different shampoos and conditioners and face washes and face moisturizers and blah, blah, blah. Like, I generally will get something different every time because I don't, I'm not usually super loyal to one particular thing. I do actually have a shampoo and conditioner that I like, and I do at this point actually have a moisturizer that I like. I still don't know what face wash I like, which is another reason why I don't rebuy it immediately when I run out, because I don't know, like I might just start using fucking bar soap on my face, like whatever. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the point is, it gives me pause now, like if I kind of like see something and sort of want to try it, it's like, well, I'm not going to be done with my current version of whatever this is, face wash, moisturizer, whatever it is, for, hmm, let's see, another three months? So why get this now? You know, it's it's been eye-opening to like, you know, when I'm only buying things as a last resort, which is essentially, you know, the easiest way to say, what my no buy is. I buy things only as a last resort. <laughs> and I do that in person as much as possible. And online is absolutely very last place I go with the exception, books is the only exception to that. Because when I want books, I can't afford them new. And I also 
like whenever possible, want to get the cover that I want. And with thrift books, you can see exactly what cover you're getting, what edition you're getting. It tells you whether or not it used to be a library book, which I always choose that option if it's available. If it's an ex-library book, that's what... <clears throat> I've got to bring myself a drink for this video. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I feel like I'm just really even more all over the place than usual, but hopefully you guys are entertained by something or else you wouldn't still be here. Um, this is a silly thing that I wrote down, like what I've learned, but I learned that I don't really need Amazon for anything, which is great because I don't want to buy from Amazon. Um, I haven't made a single Amazon purchase in 2024. I looked it up the other day because I was like, maybe there's been something that like, you know, was technically a replacement. So I allowed myself to buy it or whatever. And I checked. Nope, not a single thing. So, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> I'm really proud of that. I have bought a few things on eBay because um, there have been some replacement things that I bought on eBay, but um, not Amazon and nothing on Etsy either, probably. I would assume like I don't really even look at Etsy anymore the only thing Etsy is good for in my opinion is vintage clothing because I know all of my measurements and when I want something specific you know like a an item of clothing is something that I take care of until it's falling apart and I can no longer repair it you know so an item of clothing like I will pay the extra to get something that's exactly my size and something that is exactly what I want um, so that's really the only thing that Etsy is good for because <laughs> usually sellers on Etsy are given those very specific measurements, you know, um, what else that I learned? I already said this, but you know, just to reiterate it, cheap is just as good as expensive. If you're out there not being able to afford all of the things that you want, um, I promise you, you can find alternatives that are affordable for you. I promise. Um, it's, it's really easy to sort of get sucked into like the marketing and the packaging and the shine of things online. But I found that for me, part of the reason why I was buying so many things online is because I needed that next step of holding the thing in my hand to know whether or not I wanted it. And I was actually like, I didn't, you know, I wasn't cognizant of this, but I was buying things so that I could touch them. But when you're in the store, you could do that. <laughs> you could be like, oh yes, this is not gonna work for me. Set it back down. And so I was feeling this sort of, uh, desperation and frustration when I was shopping online because there's the screen in between. You can't actually experience the thing, which I've talked about before, so I'll skip over that for now. But um, mm -mm, I've already said all that shit. So let's get into, I was gonna make an entire video about this, but um, I, I don't know, I'm just gonna do it now. <laughs> I'm gonna give you my budget witch tips, which other people have done this before and they've done it better than me, but um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you what I do as far as witchy supplies now that I'm a no buy kind of girl. <laughs> um, because like some of these tips are like super obvious and other people have said the same thing before, but you know, I'm just telling you what I do and I'm sure it's similar to what a lot of other people do, and I'm sure other people have better videos about this, but I'm just letting you know my thing right now, okay? Um, I get all of my witchy candles now at the dollar store. So here's what I do. I was gonna bring it out, but anyway, they have these little packs of like six tea light candles, different scents. My favorite is the lime coconut, because they're green, and I actually, but I don't want to get up because then you're going to see my sweatpants. <laughs> I don't want to edit this video. <laughs> but anyway, you know what tea lights look like. They're at the Dollar Tree. Um, I, you may have that in your town. I mean, if you don't, then you have some other dollar store, right? Um, but anyway, so 
I I will get those little six packs of tea light candles, $1.25. Um, Dollar Tree 25. <laughs> um, I get those and I use those. I use like two tea light candles a week because I use them. It's kind of a ritual with my radio show every week. I light my tea light candles and um, so I don't use a lot of them. I also, this is a new thing that I've started doing, which is so simple and easy to do. Do you see my uh, seven day prayer candles here in the background? Those are, yeah, those, they're just like the seven day candles that are, that don't have a picture on them. They're just like a color of candle. Like this one's almost burned out, but it was, you know, it's like a dark green. I, I bought those. I peeled the, there's like a plastic overlay. I peeled that off and like took all the sticky gunk off of it. And then I have this accidental knockoff of the Centennial that I got from Amazon years ago um, that I was gonna return, but then I didn't do it in time or something. Um, so it's, it's a knock, I have a knockoff deck of the Centennial. And so I'm using the cards just with decoupage glue and Elmer's. Like it's not super, like you can probably tell it's kind of messy but I just glued it on there and like used like little hair tie rubber bands to hold it down so it would, you know, fit the curve while it was drying. And I'm just gonna do that with that deck. Like it's a dollar twenty-five for one of these candles, and I can make it into whatever. This time I have, oh, I have a magician and a high priestess. This candle is hot. <laughs> The High Priestess is not as hot for some reason. Okay, I'm gonna put them back now. But yeah, it's just, you know, super easy. And I'm sure you have, like even if you don't have like an accidental knockoff, like I do, deck. Maybe you have a deck that you don't really like all the images, but you like some of the images, so you don't really use it. And you could, you could glue, you could glue them. Glue them to a seven day prayer candle. And yeah, it does get annoying once they're burned down that far. You need to have long matches or like a long candle lighter or something like that. But they last a long time. You know, I, I light them every day for a little while, usually. Um, and I've had these for a couple months now. Just, you know, relighting them whenever I want to for however long. And when they run out, it's only $1.25 for more. I actually already have my next replacement. I just haven't glued the cards to them yet. But, so I get all my candles from Dollar Tree. That's a tip. Um, you could also, like, if you don't have, like, a local dollar store that sells things like that, um, obviously, like, you can find cheap candles at Walmart. You can find um, another great place to get the seven-day prayer candles is, um, like, Mexican grocery stores. Um, if your neighborhood has one like that um, has one of those and you can get them. Sometimes you can just get them at grocery stores. Like my local Walmart used to have them, but they don't have them anymore unless they just move them and I can't fucking find them, which is highly probable, <laughs> highly possible. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, so that's, you, you know, you, you don't have to pay for candles. I mean, most people know this. You don't have to pay a lot for candles. Incense is fucking cheap. That's something that I tell myself. I used to like, you know, get really down on how little money I had. And I would tell myself, I can still afford incense. It's like $2 for a package. I go through probably the equivalent of one package per week because I do burn a shit ton of incense in my life. But um, yeah, it's, it's still affordable. Incense is still affordable, guys. Um, uh, what else? Oh, this I kind of said earlier, but yeah, take breaks from especially expensive staples in your life. Like when you run out of something that you're used to rebuying that costs a lot of money, take some time, you know, try out other things, try out alternatives. And, and then if like after a month, you really, really miss that expensive candle that you usually get, um, go ahead and buy it. You know, like you tried, 
You tried to go without it and it turns out it's something that really makes you happy and then you'll know and then you'll appreciate it even more when you get to have it again, right? Um, and obviously you don't need to follow that tip if you can afford the expensive things, but this is if it's more difficult for you to afford the expensive things. If it's more difficult for you to afford the expensive things, take a break from them every once in a while and see if you really care about them as much as you thought you did. That's my biggest tip. Um, what else? When it comes to like spells and stuff, I'm not the best person to talk to about this. I feel like I'm not really qualified, but I do feel confident saying this. When you are choosing your ingredients for a spell, don't go buy things. Use what you have in your house. Because even if you have barely anything, even if all you do is go outside and pluck a leaf off a tree in your neighborhood, if you whisper to that leaf what you intend for it to do, what you intend for its purpose to be in your spell, that's it. You know, that's, that's what works. Spells are about intentions. So as long as your intentions are clear, you can use anything you have already. Like obviously people have said the tip a million times, but just in case you haven't heard it, use your fucking kitchen herbs, things you already have in there. Use, you know, just anything you already have. And if you're just starting out on like a witchy journey and you're buying supplies for the first time, buy them slowly. You don't need all the things that other people have and you may not have a use for them. Like I don't have a use for a wand. <laughs> I like having an athame, but I don't really use it for the things that people use athames for. <laughs> um, you know, you may not, like if you're looking at one of those diagrams of like everything you need for your altar, <laughs> um, you don't need all those things. You may not want all those things. So acquire them slowly, try them out, see if they actually work for you. And the places that you can get witchy things, it's everywhere. Yard sales, thrift stores, flea markets, everywhere. Like almost every witchy thing I have is like a hand-me-down or, you know, like a rock that you find on a walk is just as magical. In fact, I would even argue more magical than a crystal you buy in a shop. A rock you find on a walk is more magical than a crystal you find in the shop. <laughs> is that poetic? <laughs> it sounds like it to me right now. I need to eat lunch, guys. Okay, so I should probably start winding it down, but I'm still excited to talk, so I'm just gonna keep, I'm just gonna keep info dumping at you and hopefully you're taking breaks. <laughs> anyway, uh, what else? Mm -mm -mm, thrift stores and flea markets. I mean, this is another pretty basic one, but like if you're wanting to use spell candles, which most of my magic includes candles. Um, if you're wanting spell candles, but you don't have a witchy shop in your area or like, I mean, spell candles are usually pretty affordable if you do have a witchy shop in your area, but if you don't, you can just buy birthday candles at the grocery store or the dollar store or the party supply store, wherever's closest. Like, and bonus, they're witty little, they're, they're whittle. So you can, uh, you know, enjoy a short spell, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, that's a pretty basic thing that like people will say, but it's a good tip. What else? Okay, yeah, that's pretty much it. So like me having budget witchy tips is not, you know, <laughs> really it's just out of necessity things that I've discovered. And my biggest thing is like, it's so nice to be able to just go to the dollar store to get my candles now, because I used to get a lot of candles from a witchy store that's an hour away from my house. So I would have to like buy them in bulk and they were pretty expensive too. And they were, I would get these votive candles that are like an irregular size too. So I'd have to, I couldn't use regular votive candle holders it, anyway. And they cost like $3 each and sometimes they didn't have them in stock. So I'd get all the way there and they wouldn't be there. And like, yeah, I mean, I love, I love paying for things that are made ethically, but 
let's be real, not all of us can do it. So if you can't, it's okay to buy things at dollar stores. It's okay. Just don't like, you know, use it as an excuse. Like I know people that will go to the dollar store just because they want to pick me up and they'll spend like 30 bucks on a bunch of cheap shit that they don't even use. Like I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, you know, and I'm not trying to like, you know, make you feel bad if you do that. Like, you know, that's between you and your journal. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm not here to judge, but for me personally, like, I don't want to be buying stuff I'm not going to be using. And so I, I'm trying to avoid that in my own life as much as possible. So there you go. I've talked about a lot of things. Um, I feel like I, I, I wish I had more profound things to say about the whole no buy thing. Um, But I mean, overall, it's just changed my life. It's changed my life. And I feel better. Like this is the way that I'm supposed to live. I'm not supposed to be buying things and I'm not used to buying things anymore. And so when I do decide that I want something, there's no guilt associated with it anymore. Like for example, um, I did buy something online a couple weeks ago, it was, I have a save search on my favorite earbuds, my favorite earbuds of all time. Every time I've ever tried to get a different kind, I haven't really liked it, but they don't sell them anymore. Um, anyway, I have a save search on eBay for any time somebody lists a new pair of these earbuds, like they need to be in the box. I'm not, I'm not, out here, I'm not out here buying used earbuds. Okay. But you know, um, I have a save search and I never get a hit on it. In fact, I don't think I've ever gotten a hit on it since I set up the save search, which was, I don't know, I'm bad with time, but probably at least five years ago, maybe more. So even though I don't technically need a new pair of headphones right now, um, I did not hesitate. When those things got listed and they were a reasonable price, they were actually the same price as they were when they were new back in 2009, I just bought them. And there was no guilt at all. I realized that like all of the guilt and shame that I had surrounding the purchases that I was making before, whenever I was in the throes of addiction, the reason I was having that guilt is because of the sheer amount of shit that I was buying. I don't have that guilt anymore when I buy something because I buy it when I need it. Like obviously I don't need a pair of earbuds, like full stop. I mean, I feel like I do <laughs> because I'm very much a headphones girl, but you know, if no more earbuds existed in the universe, I could make do with my over ear headphones, you know? Um, but so it's not like I literally need it, but, um, for the most part, I'm only buying things that I need. I'm only buying things that are really worth it to me. And it's easier to see what's really worth it to me because I'm taking a break from everything. You know, I'm actually making a dent in my Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab perfumes this year because I'm down to like, I have like 10 of them left. Um, there are a few that are like ritual oils. Like I have a couple of them in this drawer thing. So it's like, it's not literally 10, but for the most part, I've got about 10 left that I wear on a regular basis. So I'm actually making a dent in them. So when I get to the point where I need to replace one of them, it's gonna be a joyful experience because it's like, I know I like this thing and it's fun to shop on the Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab website and I might even get myself something else when, when that happens, you know, not this year. Um, I do actually, like one of my exceptions is I will allow myself to buy from Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab at Halloween time. So I'm going to allow myself to buy like, you know, maybe five bottles in that order. But um, yeah, anyway, the point is I'm taking joy in purchasing now because I'm only doing it when all the stars align and it's time. And that is what works for me. Um, I mean, a big part of that is necessity because I just, you know, I work a part-time job and I make barely over minimum wage. So I don't have a lot of money. Um, so it's necessity first, but also this is actually how I enjoy living my life. So 
Anyway, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, so, and I'm not really saying what I want to be saying. Um, the other thing, I think I skipped over something in my budget witch tips. Yes, I did. Okay, let me say the thing that I skipped over. I learned I can make my own perfume. So if you're a person that likes ritual oils and burning fragrance oils and like, you know, oil burners and things, um, if you're used to buying like expensive shit that other people make, or even if you just like using perfume oils, actually, I haven't put on perfume yet today, so I'm gonna do that right now. I learned to make my own perfume, my own ritual oils, and I've even um, started like scenting unscented lotions and things like that. And basically, like I'm not gonna go into like all the steps on how you do this unless you guys are really interested. I can make an entire video on it, I guess. But um, basically you just need fragrance oils, not essential oils, fragrance oils, because they're more skin safe. Um, you get, like, I just made an order, like, a couple years ago, I think, um, on Brambleberry. I made, like, a 30 or $40 order, just got, like, I don't know, seven or eight different fragrance oils, and they come in, like, 10 milliliter bottles. Like, the sample size is, like, 10 milliliters, so it's twice this size. Um, and then you just, you know, you look up ratios online and stuff and fuck around with it. You need a carrier oil. You need the fragrance oil. You need some vitamin E. You mix it together and you wait a month for everybody to settle in and get happy with each other. And I have actually, like, this is my favorite perfume. And I made it myself. And I've also made ritual oils and I've scented, you know... So it's just super fucking comforting to me to know that one of my very favorite perfumes is one that I made and I literally have the ingredients right now to make it again. It's, I can't tell you how satisfying that is. And I think a lot of us that do have shopping addictions, we're creative people, but we are for whatever like complex psychological reasons in our lives, um, you know, there's many, many different factors here, but like we have gotten to a point for whatever reason that we've started to trust other people to make stuff for us. And I mean, like, you know, my very favorite perfume is not one that I make, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should not patronize other people's livelihoods and creative outlets but I think sometimes we let other people do that shit for us and it's just not as satisfying as doing it ourselves. And that's why I'm like really trying to have fun with experimenting with like making things. Like for example, like I didn't talk about this, but like when I made this journal, I decided I didn't really enjoy making it and I don't really enjoy the results. Like I'm gonna use it and I'm gonna like, you know, have a little self-satisfaction that I made it myself, blah, blah, blah. But overall, I prefer, um, Grace actually gave me this one, thank you Grace, I prefer books like this, you know, that you find at a bookstore for 10 or 15 bucks. Like I actually prefer someone else to make my journals for me. I don't really feel like learning how to book bind and I can afford this, you know? I've had this, I just started this journal on like January 6th, so, and I'm only halfway through it. so. You know, this is something that I can spend 10 or 15 bucks once a year to buy a beautiful journal. I don't need to make that myself, but I'm glad that I gave, I'm glad that I forced myself to try it. This isn't the first time I've made a journal, but this is just an example of something that like, I don't really want to be a journal maker. I tried it. I don't really want to do it. And I'm having a lot of experiences like that this year. I'm doing a weekly art night with Michael. Um, every Wednesday night, we do something art related. And sometimes it's as stupid as like me coloring in a coloring book for an hour, you know? Um, I just, or I'm like painting something, um, whatever, whatever it is. And I'm trying all these different things. And I'm trying all these different art mediums that I have in my house, because I have a lot of art supplies in my house that I'm not using most of the time, but. You know, 
And I'm playing around with a lot of different types of artistic expression and creative play and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And at least I'm trying it. So next time I buy a journal, I'm not going to feel... Because for me, there was a lot of thought process when I was purchasing things. There was a lot of thought process like, well, I could make this myself. Why am I buying it? But if I have made it myself and I was dissatisfied with that, then I feel more more justified and excited about buying that thing. You know, like if I had made this perfume and I didn't really like it and, you know, if I chose not to like try again and reformulate it or whatever, um, then I would be totally fine with just, and I'm still going to be buying things from Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. You know, I'm doing that and this because I like to have several different scents in my life. But, you know, if it hadn't gone so well, then I would have just felt even more satisfied with purchases that I make, you know, because I'm trying different things, you know? I don't know. Does that make sense? <sighs> okay. I need to shut up soon, but I'm still, I, I want to do this Cure album ranking thing. So I'm going to end the video with that because most of y'all are going to be like, I don't care. So my favorite band in the world is The Cure. Um... I don't have all of their albums here to do like a full tier ranking, but I'm just going to show you the ones that I actually have on vinyl and how I rank them. So they're in order from my least favorite in my collection to most. I do not have Wild Mood Swings in my collection. I do not have Wish. I do not have Three Imaginary Boys, Head on the Door. Um, but you know what? I actually did put this in my journal, so <laughs> never mind. I just said I was only going to do the ones that I have on vinyl, but I'm actually going to give you my ratings for all of them because I already did it. I have my list. I did like a ranking. <laughs> so we'll start with, we'll start with these and then I'll give you the ranking for the others. Um, no. No, we'll do it the other way. Okay, um, sometimes I just have to say the thing that I don't want and then I realize that I don't want it. <laughs> just like when I'm driving, sometimes I don't know which way to go so I just pick a direction and if it's wrong, I'll know immediately and turn around. Anyway, okay, so I'm gonna tell you the ones that aren't here first. Wild Mood Swings, that is an F. That is a pretty terrible, uneven album. <laughs> Three Imaginary Boys is a D. Also, very uneven album. It was their first album, and it was just kind of like the shit that they were working out, the shit that they were starting to play at shows and stuff. Like, they had someone kind of curate it and pick their favorites and put it on an album, and they largely didn't have control of it. It wasn't a cohesive album that you listened to from start to finish, you know? So Three Imaginary Boys is a D for me. Blood Flowers. This is their last album as far as in my head canon. They have made two albums since then, but I, they don't exist to me. <laughs> so Blood Flowers, that came out in 2000, it was pretty cohesive, actually. I need to revisit it. For now, it's in the D category because I... Don't ever really revisit it. Um, <laughs> I'm sweating right now because I'm realizing I could make an entire video about this. I'm not great at talking about music though, so I am just gonna continue having it on the end of this video. <laughs> okay, Head on the Door. This is one that came out in like, I don't have the year in front of me, but probably like 80, ish 85 and it was like after they had gotten big in Japan and they were like playing some cutesy type shit um still a little uneven but it is still a good album so I put that in the C tier um kiss me kiss me kiss me 
also not pictured here, but it's, um, it was a double album on vinyl. However, on CD, they were able to fit it on one CD, but that is just to say it is very fucking long. And it's also kind of uneven in my opinion. It's like they didn't really know what they were doing right now, but it's still overall a good album. Like, I feel like there's a good five or six tracks they could have just cut right off of there and it would have been a more cohesive album. But anyway, that's also in the C category. Wish, which is the one that, I think it came out in 92. It, it was the one after Disintegration and it was a fucking banger, actually. It was a fucking banger. I did put it in my journal in the C category, but I think it's actually in the B category because it's good. It's really good. There's some real fucking good songs on there. <laughs> I'm sweating now. Like as soon as I started talking about The Cure, I started sweating. What's that about? I think just because I'm actually very invested in talking about this kind of thing, but I don't know how to talk about it. I would like to get better at music criticism um, so this is me trying it. This is me trying it. <laughs> Stick around if you want to see me sweat. Okay. Um, Japanese Whispers. That is a B. This is actually just an EP, but it has um, Love Cats, Let's Go to Bed, and other really fun tracks like that. You know, this was also in their era of realizing that I think this, I'm, I may be wrong about this, but I think this is in their era of realizing that they were super big in Japan and kind of like using that information to sort of pander to their Japanese fan base a little bit. I mean, they got some really good songs out of it. Like this is when Robert Smith finally decided to lighten up a little bit and have some fun, which is when he wrote Love Cats, Let's Go to Bed, um, The Walk, um, you know, just fun stuff like that when he was not doing anything fun before that. So this is like early 80s still, like maybe 84. Um, then we have everything else is pictured. So let me go through the top. Okay, so this album came out. Mm, this was actually pretty much a Robert Smith solo album because he was sort of like he had kicked other people out of the band at this point. This was right after a lot of drama with touring very dark, psychologically upsetting albums for years on end and getting famous and blah, blah, blah. So this one is kind of like their psychedelic record. If The Cure had a psychedelic record, it has some weird shit on it. Like some of the track titles. Um, Banana Fish Bones, Piggy in the Mirror, Bird Mad Girl, <laughs> um, Shake Dog Shake. This is, oh, apparently I have a limited edition. Number 1,184 of 2,500. And it's like gold. The record is gold. Anyway, a lot of people like, I think would rank this one really low. And it's not a great album. It's definitely sort of an experimental album for them, um, but I like it. So I actually put it in the C tier. So next, this is a, my actual version of this is a double album of 17 Seconds and Faith. So this is not the normal cover that you would get with either of those albums. Um, but Faith would be next for me. I actually like, I usually put it really high in my mind but I listened to it the other day and I was like I don't know like of the so the trilogy as far as I'm concerned and a lot of other people I think would actually agree with this for Cure albums is 17 seconds faith and pornography and that was the order they came out to in quick succession too because 17 seconds was 80 I think it was I'm pretty sure 17 seconds was 80, Faith was 81, and I know Pornography is 82. So those are like the three, that's the trilogy of Dark Cure albums. That is when they established themselves as a goth band. And 17 seconds was their second album. So if you don't count Boys Don't Cry, because Boys Don't Cry and 17, and uh, Three Imaginary Boys were just sort of, they were 
had different track lists, but they were essentially different versions of the same album, in my opinion. Um, so I'm so nervous about this, <laughs> but I want to talk about music more because I'm the mixtress and music is literally the most important thing to me. Um, spoiler alert, spoiler alert for my like beliefs discussion that will be up maybe later this month, maybe sometime this summer. The thing that's most spiritual to me in my life is music, full stop. That's the thing that has stuck around no matter what. It is the most magical thing in my opinion. Anyway, so Faith I put as A tier. 17 seconds is also A tier. So I guess it makes sense that they're on the same, in the same format as a double album in my collection. Um, they're damn good is what they are. Disintegration. I mean, this is most people's favorite Cure album and they're not wrong. Did you hear my stomach? Oh my God, I need to eat lunch. So I will stop soon, I swear. Um, it's most people's favorite. It's not my very, very favorite, but I do put it in the S tier. Like it is above A. It is, it's really long, but I, I usually skip Love Song and Pictures of You. Pictures of You is just, there's something that's just like, I think it's like shadow work that I'm not ready for yet <laughs> or something. Um, and Love Song, don't get me started on Love Song. I could probably do an entire video about how Love Song's not actually a love song. Even though he meant it to be a love song because he wrote it as a wedding present to his longtime girlfriend, Mary, that he's been with, like they literally met and started dating when they were like 14 or 15 and they're still together. So he meant for it to be a love song. I do not see it as a love song and I have opinions about that. But anyway, um, part of that is just, it's personal for me. In fact, probably most of it is the personal aspect for me. Um, so I won't get into that right now. But anyway, Disintegration is almost everybody's favorite Cure album and it is fucking good. I mean, when you think about, they made this in 1989 when they made their, when 17 Seconds was 1979. So they're 10 years into their career at this point. I think this was their ninth album. Let's see, Three Imaginary Boys, 17 Seconds, Faith, Pornography. Ooh, what comes after that? I, I get fuzzy on the order after that, but Head on the Door and the Top, not necessarily in that order. Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me than Disintegration, I think. So yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure this is their ninth album. So how many bands can you say that their ninth album was the banger that most people say is their favorite? So this came out in 1989. I think I said that already, anyway. And it's, yeah, it's the best album to put on on a rainy day. There actually is a lot of rain sounds throughout the album. It's, this is his Saturn Returns album too. Like if you want to throw astrology into it because he was turning 30 around the time that he made this album. Um, and he was, Robert Smith is hilarious. He like, you know, he started talking about feeling old at like 23. So <laughs> he has like always felt old, I think. But um, yeah, this is, it's solid. It definitely has more production value than my, top album of The Cure. My favorite has always been Pornography. It came out the year I was born. It's not why it's my favorite. And it is dark, man. It is. And the touring of this album, like it, it really fucked them up um, psychologically. I mean, I think also they were doing a lot of drugs and drinking a lot and really grappling with fame. Um, so there's a lot to it, but they made some fucking amazing shit out of that angst. This is one of my top five albums of all time. So this is definitely in the S tier, um, but it is my number one and I play it often. Apparently I have a promotional copy. Um, anyway, um, it's good shit. 
It's really good shit. I don't know what to say about it. It just... Something about, like, I just recently learned, this is a whole other fucking topic, but I just recently learned about the Enneagram. Have you guys done this particular personality assessment? It's been around forever, and I just learned about it. I just found out I am a type four, which is the artist. Um, and one of the main characteristics of the artist archetype, Enneagram, whatever, um, is that they're melancholy. <laughs> At first I was like, I'm not melancholy, says the fucking goth girl whose favorite band is The Cure. Um, yeah, I am. I am melancholy. <laughs> like, it's interesting. Um, anyway, that's a whole other thing. I want to do a favorites video where I talk about all the books I've read this year because I've been reading a lot. Um, but I need to stop because I've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. So that's uh, the No One Asked Cure album tier list let me know in the comments below what your favorite cure album is and what you think about like you know i don't know do you love the ones that they came out with in the last i mean the only two albums they've released since 2000s blood flowers are one self-titled album and one called 413 dream i don't even know if i've listened to them in, in their entirety or maybe i tried and just couldn't get through it but anyway, do you like those? Um, do you like the, I mean, with The Cure, you've got, you know, sort of the Friday I'm in Love, Love Cats, fun songs. And then you've got the, you know, the really dark, punishing, sad songs. Um, do you like one over the other? I mean, it's a very, even though Robert Smith is the main the main person behind most of what you hear of The Cure. He, he writes most of the lyrics, he does, he's one of the only actually good musicians in the band. <laughs> um, historically, like, he keeps people around him for vibes, um, and not necessarily talent, um, and there have been lots of different Cure members over the, not a lot, but there's been different lineups over the years, but Robert Smith has been the constant. So it's mostly him that should get credited with the, the musical shit. What was my, what was the beginning of this sentence? Oh, he himself is a Taurus, but The Cure comes off to me as a very Gemini band, <laughs> which as I'm filming this, we're still firmly in Gemini season, but we're going to be leaving Gemini season by the time you see this but um I kind of enjoy both aspects of it I love the like poppy fun ridiculous cure songs as much as maybe not as much as I love the darker shit um the darker shit just it's just I would say the cure is the most atmospheric band that I like like that is my favorite type of music a I like music that makes, that takes me to another realm, you know, that feels like it is a landscape in and of itself. You know, I like to feel surrounded by the sounds. I like to feel hugged and held, and I feel hugged and held by really dark, scary music, so. Anyway, stopping, because my stomach, I seriously think that last one you could probably hear. So I'm gonna go eat and um, I hope you have a beautiful day.